So on this topic now, we'll look at the internal features of the heart. The topic that we did covering only the external features of the heart. Now the focus will be on the internal ones. So we'll look at the features found in each four chambers of the heart. So we have four chambers shown here. That is the right atrium. Remember that its position is anterior. It is found laterally also, and then occupying the posterior aspect as well. This is the left atrium. Its position is posterior. So when you're looking at the heart from the anterior side, you will not see the, the, right, the left atrium. Then these are the two ventricles. This is a right ventricle. This is a left ventricle. Then in between the ventricles and the atria, we have valves. So on the right side, we have three valves. On the left side, we have two valves. So on the left, we call it the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve or the bicuspid valve. Then on the right side, we call it the tricuspid valve. Then, as blood leaves the ventricles, from the right side, it goes to the lungs via the pulmonary trunk, in which we find the semilunar valves or the pulmonary valves, shown here. Then, from the left side, go, blood goes to all parts of the body through the iota. In the iota there, we have similar semilunar valves or simply aortic valves. Then we see that between ventricles, we have septa. Just pardon me. Sorry for that. So I was talking about saying between the ventricles, between the atrias, and between ventricles and atria, we are going to have septum. So we see that in the ventricles, we have the ventricular septum here. So this is right ventricle, left ventricle, then we have septum there. Then along this area here where we have the skeleton of the heart known as the cardiac skeleton we are dividing atria from ventricle so these are atria above ventricles below then we have septum this is the atria now that wall at the back there that is a septum separating the right atria from the left atria so we have ventricular septum atrial septum and atrioventricular septum here so let's begin with the right side of the heart. What is the function of the right side of the heart? So the right side of the heart pushes blood towards the lungs. So it supplies blood to pulmonary circulation. And then the left side of the heart pushes blood towards systemic circulation so blood coming from this side the right will go to the lungs so let's follow with the right atria first so right atria receives deoxygenated blood from the superior vena cava from the inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus these are the main supply in addition to that the right atria receives deoxygenated blood from two sources number one are the anterior cardiac veins anterior cardiac veins these ones here you see those veins they are about three or four branches so one two three those in blue 
these are called anterior cardiac veins. They open direct into the right atria. In addition to that, we have what we call vena cordis minimi. This is a myocardial layer, blood vessels supplying these muscles. Uh, small arteries, then the veins draining these muscles open direct into all the four chambers. So there'll be small blood vessels, the veins, perforating the endocardium to go into the chamber. So we call those as vena cordis minimi. So in total, we have four vessels bringing blood into the right atria. All of it is deoxygenated blood. Number one is superior vena cava. Number two, inferior vena cava. Number three, coronary sinus. Number four, anterior cardiac vein. Five is venae codis minimi. Vena codis minimi. This one here. So these are small veins opening direct into the chambers of the heart. So let's look at what is seen inside the right atrium. So when we're discussing sulcus found on the surface of the heart, we discovered to say there's a sulcus found on the posterior aspect of the right atrium. We call that as sulcus terminalis. Inside the heart or inside the atrium is represented by this lamp here called crista terminalis. That is crista terminalis. So the crista terminalis and the sulcus terminalis on the surface divide the internal aspect of the right atrium into anterior compartment and posterior compartment. The anterior compartment is made rough by the presence of these special muscles found known as pectinate muscles. So these are pectinate muscles or muscuri pectinati. That is muscuri pectinati or pectinate muscles. Okay. So this is a special feature found in the right atrium only. The posterior surface of the right atrium is smooth, as it can be seen here. Anterior one is made rough by muscuri pectinati. Okay. Then we observe that in the posterior aspect of the right atrium, there is a small depression there known as fossa ovalis. Fossa ovalis is a representation of foramen ovali. Foramen ovali is an opening in the posterior wall of the right atrium that connects the right atrium to the left atrium. So in fetal circulation, that is an important shunt because it allows blood in the right atrium to reach the left atrium because during that phase of life, the lungs are non-functional. So because of that, we find that there is communication between the right and the left atrium. But after birth, that foramen ovary closes due to pressure changes in the lungs. And as a result, we find that it is closed. And what remains there is that depression called fossa ovaris. In addition, the pectinate muscles, apart from just making the anterior surface of the inner surface of the right atrium to be rough, it serves as an important feature there because it allows or rather prevents mixture of blood coming from the inferior vena cava in fetal life mixing with blood coming from the superior vena cava because in fetal life blood coming from the inferior vena cava is coming from the umbilical cord from the placenta and that blood is oxygenated blood in the superior vena cava however is deoxygenated so when blood comes in the right atria through the inferior vena cava, it passes direct through the fossa, through the foramen ovary into the left atrium. Whereas blood through the superior vena cava will pour into the right atrium, go to the left, to the right ventricle, and then pushed through the 
pulmonary trunk into the iota. Okay. In addition to that, we see other smaller openings. Okay. So, right close to the valve separating the right atrium from the right ventricle, we see an opening of the coronary sinus. So, coronary sinus acts as a pool where all the veins that are draining the heart meet. Okay. So, the diagram that we had showing the coronary sinus. This is a coronary sinus here. That structure there. So the small cardiac vein, which is shown here at the bottom, and the great cardiac vein, which is here, all of them come and meet in the coronary sinus. Then the coronary sinus drains into the right atrium. So you can see that opening there. That opening leads at the back where the coronary sinus is. So that way blood from the heart also joins with all the blood coming from the inferior vena cava and blood coming from the superior vena cava. Now, another feature to take note within the right atrium is location of the AC node and location of the AV node. So this is a superior vena cava. So right at the entrance there of the superior vena cava in the myocardial layer, is where the SA node is positioned. So the SA node will be somewhere here. Then AV node is closer to the tricuspid valve here. This is where the AV node will be, right in the myocardium. Okay. So what we are seeing there are the tricuspid valve. Then superior to the atrium is the auricle. So this is the right auricle. So as the heart is developing, it has, of course, ventricles and atria. Now, the atria in fetal life are superseded or they are replaced by adult atria as the fetus grows. So the auricle, where the small atria, when the heart first formed, so that structure doesn't disappear, instead remains as the auricle or the ear of the atrium. So both left and right atrium have auricles or ears, if you like. So those are things to look out for in the right atria. Number one is crista terminalis, separating anterior surface of the atrium, which is made rough inside there by pectinate muscles. Posterior surface is smooth. The same posterior surface is the septum, separating right atria from left atria at the back there. Within the same wall, we see a depression which was previously foramen ovale, then closes now to form fossa ovale, which is there. The next we look at is opening of the coronary sulcus. So this is opening of the coronary sulcus there. Then we see that within the left atrium, or right atrium, is where the first two parts of the conduction system of the heart is found. That is SA node at the entrance of the superior vena cava and AV node closer to the tricuspid valve, origin of the tricuspid valve somewhere there. Okay. So now we're saying five vessels empty into the right atrium, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, anterior cardiac veins, and the vena cordis minimi. Vena cordis minimi plus the coronary sinus. Okay. Let's look at the right ventricle. Which features are we interested in in the right ventricles? So, in the right ventricle, first of all, we see that between the ventricles and the atria are the tricuspid valve there. Now, they are called tri because there are three sets of valves. And these sets of valves prevent
So these sets of valves prevent backflow or regurgitation of blood from the ventricles into the atria when the ventricles are contracting. So how do we name these valves? Since there are three, collectively they are called tricuspid, but individually we give them name according to their position. So we have three sets. One lies anterior. This is the anterior surface of the heart, this one here. This is what we are facing and looking at. This is anterior. Then posterior is down here. Then there is a septum separating the right ventricle from the left ventricle. So they are given those names. This is the anterior cassip or flap, if you like, or valve. Then down there is posterior valve. Then at the far end is a marginal or what we call septal valve. So three. Other features I want us to look at are the muscles here. We can see those conical shaped muscles there. So we call those muscles as papillary muscles. Then connecting the muscles to the valves are tendons. Those tiny strands, those are tendons. They are called chordae tendinae or tendinous cords. So we've mentioned about three structures. The valves, which are three in total, anterior valve, posterior valve, and septal valve. Then these valves are attached to the papillary muscles. These muscles contract together with the ventricles. So those are called papillary muscles. Connecting the valves to the muscles are the tendinous cords or called the tendinae. Okay. Then we see that in both ventricles, right and left ventricle, we see that there is other muscles apart from the papillary muscles. There are those rough, rough muscles. So we see that the inner surface has more like ridges. Those are muscles called trabeculae canae muscles. Trabeculae canae muscles. So both left and right ventricles have those muscles and more so in the right atrium, in the right ventricle. So the right ventricle has more trabeculae canae muscles than left ventricle, because at least blood reaching the right ventricle has a lot of turbulent, and to prevent those bubbles forming, we have trabeculae canae muscles in both ventricles. So that's what to look out for in the right ventricle. It's the tricuspid valve, papillary muscles, chordae tendinae, and trabeculae canae muscles. Blood from the right ventricle will push through the pulmonary trunk, which splits to give us pulmonary arteries. But we see that before that, there are valves also guarding. So there is no way blood in the pulmonary trunk will flow back into the right ventricle as long as these valves are functioning correctly we call them semilunar valves we'll talk about them in details for now let's go to the left side of the heart okay so this is what was seen in the heart just magnified these are the tricuspid valve these are the papillary muscles those are the chordae tendinae Code tendine, code tendine, code tendine. Okay. Pulmonary valve. So there are three. Semilunar valve. Therefore, giving us three sinuses. So this is a valve. That's a valve and a valve. Now that space inside the valve there is what we call a sinus. So there are three sinuses and three valves. So when the blood, when the heart is relaxing during the diastolic phase, when the heart is not contracting, blood pulls here and therefore tenses the valves, preventing blood to go back in the heart. So those are that is a sinus, then this is a valve. So blood will collect here, collect there, but will not pass through here to go back into the 
ventricle. So similar structures will be seen in the aorta. The aorta has semilunar valves like this. We call aortic valves. Equally, there will be sinuses inside those valves and serves a similar purpose to hold blood so that it doesn't seep back into the ventricle during the diastolic phase. So we look at the left atrium now. So where is blood in the left atrium coming from? So blood in the left atrium is coming from the lungs. So each lung sends two pulmonary veins. And we're saying these are the only veins in the body that will carry deoxygenated, that will carry oxygenated blood. So there will be two entering from the left side, two entering from the right side. So we call them as superior and inferior pulmonary veins. And I'll take you back to a diagram that was showing us the posterior aspect of the lung, of the heart. This one here, this is the left atrium. So these are the right pulmonary veins. These are the left pulmonary veins. And each side has a superior and inferior. So that is superior, that is inferior, superior, inferior. Even though we are calling them veins here, these are carrying oxygenated blood direct from the lungs. So those are the four vessels entering in the left atria. In addition to that, we have the small vena cordis minimi. So equally, the left atria will receive oxygenated blood from four vessels and deoxygenated blood from small veins called vena cordis minimi. Okay, so both atria are receiving blood from veins. Superior, inferior, left pulmonary, superior, inferior, right pulmonary veins, then plus vena cordis minimi. So five vessels here, five vessels there. Right atria, left atria. Anything special inside the left atria? Not much. So the left atria has no smooth and rough surface. The entire inner surface of the left atria is smooth. So the pectinate muscles are absent in the left atria. Okay. Let's look at the left ventricle. So left ventricle we're saying is now receiving blood from the left atria plus the vena cordis minimi. Now, instead of having three valves between the left atria and the left ventricle, we have two valves. So we call them as bicuspid or mitral valves. So these are the valves. So they are just simply termed as anterior and posterior. This is anterior, which is above. That is posterior, which is below. Similar arrangement, connecting the valves to the muscles, the papillary muscles are the corded tendine shown here or tendinous cords. In addition to that, we find that there is still trabecular canine muscles here, as you can see there. Okay, those are trabecular canine muscles. Then another observation is that the thickness of the myocardium in the left ventricle is larger compared to from the right ventricle. Look at that, quite thin compared with a thick musculature on the left ventricle here. Okay. Then blood from here now will flow through the aortic valves to go into the aorta and pumped to the systems. Okay. So now we see that blood from the lungs is coming to the heart through the left atria. So in an instance where there is lower respiratory tract infection, for example, infection with beta hemolytic streptococcus, which causes rheumatic fever, you find that that infection affecting the lungs can spread from the lung tissue to go into the pulmonary circulation. 
And since blood from the lungs will first encounter the left side of the heart, it is usually the mitral valve that is affected in babies who have rheumatic heart fever that later on complicates into rheumatic heart disease. So what happens is that that bacteria and its toxins will come and colonize the connective tissue of the mitral valve or the bicuspid valve causes inflammation, and then the valves become incompetent. So therefore, effective closure of the mitral valve is affected. So when the heart is contracting, blood will flow through the aorta, and some of the blood goes back into the left atria. With time, that leads to cardiac failure, left-sided heart failure, which can complicate into congestive cardiac failure where both the left and right side of the heart have failed. So this is the first valve to be knocked out in patients with rheumatic heart disease because it's the first valve that comes in contact with the microorganism from the respiratory system. Okay. So again here, seen more closely, these are the papillary muscles. Those are the cord tendine and those are the posterior, anterior. Then down below there are the posterior valves of the mitral valve. Then we're saying blood from the right ventricle pass through the aorta. So this is aorta that has been cut open. Equally, we see that in the aorta, we have three semilunar valves, C-shaped like that. Then the space inside those valves, we call them sinuses. Now, within these sinuses, we see that two of the three sinuses have small foramens. You see that foramen and another foramen. Those are origins of the coronary arteries. So the left coronary artery will come out of from there. Then the right coronary artery will come th originate through that aspect. So the right coronary supplying the right side of the heart, the left coronary supplying the left side of the heart. So we see that the first branches of the aorta is the coronary artery and coronary arteries are the ones that supply blood to the heart. Therefore, the heart feeds itself before feeding other organs. Okay. So again, here are the aortic sinuses and the valves shown. So these prevent regurgitation of blood from the aorta back into the left ventricle. So they serve as guards to prevent backflow or regurgitations. Let's look at the cardiac skeleton. So cardiac skeleton is a ring of fibrous connective tissue found within the heart. So this ring encircles the heart internally. So we can't see it externally. It is found inside the heart there. So what happens is the cardiac skeleton is formed by these fibrous rings. And that's where all the valves of the heart are positioned. So on the left side, we have the mitral or bicuspid valve. On the right side, we have the tricuspid valve. Then this is the aortic valve, and that is the pulmonary valve. So since this is made up of connective tissue, you see that it acts as an insulator. So it seals off the atria above from ventricles below. Now, we know that within the heart, we have cells that are specialized to initiate and conduct electrical impulses so that the cardiac muscles can contract. We call that as a cardiac conduction system. Now, this conduction system runs from the atria all the way to the ventricles. So we see that there's just a small space shown here in yellow where the conduction system, these are nerves, by the way, nerve, neuro, Myo neuro cells, cells that have dual property. They have muscle property and nerve property. So that is AC node, AV node, 
bundle of E's, the bundle branches that is left and right, and the Pakinji fibers. So to connect AV node, because we have SA node in the right atria, AV node in the right atria. The AV node is connected to the bundle of E's. So the bundle of E's is the one that will connect now the two nodes to the ventricles. So there's just a small space within the skeleton here. So all of it is connective tissue and connective tissue does not conduct electrical impulse. So electrical impulses from the atria where the SA node is found will only reach the ventricles by passing this through this small space here. The rest of these other structures are insulated by the cardiac skeleton. So what is the function of this cardiac skeleton? Number one is structural support because that's where all the valves are found and muscles are inserting in it, as we can see, prevents valves from being overly distended. So when the valves are shutting down and opening to prevent over stretching of the valves, the skeleton does that. Then serves as anchor or attachment of the myocardium. So all these cardiac muscles are inserting in this connective tissue. Then finally, like I was explaining, acts as electrical insulator between the atria and ventricle. Okay. So here we have areas or precordial areas of auscultation and what we are trying to feel for. So think for opening and closure of valves. So in the fifth intercostal space, mid axilla, mid clavicular line, we are mitro area, closure and opening of mitral valve. Fourth intercostal space, just next to the sternum there, we are feeling for opening and closure of tricuspid valve. Second intercostal space, just next to the sternum, is closure and opening of pulmonary valves. Then here, second intercostal space on the right side or can be palpated from there. Opening and closure of aortic valve. Okay, so that is about internal features of the heart. What do we see in the ventricles? What do we see in the atria? So we are looking at muscles, we are looking at tendons, we are looking at valves. Then there are also other smaller muscles called trabecular canae muscles, those roughened muscles there. Then we talked about tricuspid valve and mitral valves. Then we also have aortic and pulmonary valves. In the next topic, we'll discuss the electrical conduction system of the heart. Again, if there are any queries or concerns, you can still reach out to me. I'll be able to respond to your questions.